Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Welcome to worship here at the First Presbyterian Church of Naples, where we say and believe that we're in the heart of Naples with the love of God. We worship, we love, we grow, we serve. We welcome all, and that means you here in the sanctuary, as well as all of you joining us online today. I'm Rex Childs. I'm the associate pastor here at the church, and the rest of our worship team today includes Reverend Lisa Lefko, the CEO of Habitat for Humanity, who will be preaching for us today, uh, Dr. Bryce Gerlock, our director of music at the organ bench. Uh, our liturgist today is Deacon Gary Root. Thank you, Gary. And upstairs on the cameras, we have Caitlin Hancock, David Fister, and Taylor Irvin. And a quick note, we want to say thank you to Caitlin Hancock. This is going to be her last Sunday upstairs. She's been serving with us for two years. She's getting ready to head off to college uh, for the Honors College at Florida State University. So if we could offer our thanks to Caitlin. Thank you so much, and our best wishes to you. Uh, please do take some time to look at the announcements in the back of your bulletin. Uh, I'll highlight just a few. Uh, one correction in the bulletin, we uh, unfortunately forgot to include the flower dedication this week, and the flower dedication is from Kathy Norgart in memory of her son, Ryan. So thank you, Kathy. Uh, as a reminder, the Narthex renovation continues. Please stay clear of the construction area. Uh, the restrooms are open in the hallway. You just need to head out into Spencer Hall before you go back into the hallway. Uh, there will be a Seekers and Joiners class after the worship service next Sunday. So if you'd like to become a member of our church, if you'd like to just know a bit more about our church, we invite you to join. It's in the parlor uh, for just about an hour. There are also uh, nomination forms. We're looking for nominations for elders and deacons. Uh, please get those in before the end of the month. I also have one death to announce. Uh, Norma D'Alessandro passed away this Friday. Uh, please pray for Richard and Norma's family. We give thanks to God for the gift of her life, that her pain is now ended, and that she has joined the saints in light. Our practice now is to stand and to greet one another, passing the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ. The peace of Christ be with you. Please join. All right, and let's face forward and find the camera, and we'll offer the peace of Christ to those worshiping online. The peace of Christ be with you. And now let's all join together in our call to worship. O oh, give thanks to the Lord. Sing to God. Tell of God's wonderful works. Remember all the things God has done. We glory in God's holy name. Seek the Lord, our strength and refuge. We come to be in God's presence. Let us worship God. Our opening hymn is Praise Ye the Lord, the Almighty.
and please be seated. Siblings in Christ, we come before God not as despised sinners, but as beloved children. So with the confidence of the children of God, let us humbly confess our sin together. Let us pray. Holy God, it is easy to confess with our lips that you are Lord, but it is much harder to believe with our hearts to live in a way that puts you first. We are quick to trust in idols. We depend on what we can see, touch, and control. Instead of waiting to hear your still, small voice. Forgive us, Lord, and help our unbelief, so that what we confess with our lips we may truly believe in our hearts. So now hear the good news. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and freed from sin. So receive God's forgiveness and be at peace. Thanks be to God. And please be seated, except for any of God's children that would like to come forward and sit on the chancel steps with me. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, guys. How are you? Hello. Good morning. It's so good to see you. We're glad you're here this morning. Well... How was the first few days of school? Hi, Vivian. Yeah, first few days were good? All right. I bet it's hard coming back from summer, but I bet you're glad to see all your friends at school. Great. Well, I have something that I'm hoping you will learn today, and it's about, I'll show the congregation as well, it's about this lizard. I don't really like reptiles, I don't know about you, but this is a pretty cool lizard. Can you see him? This lizard is called the basilisk lizard. It's kind of small, but it looks like an iguana with its long tail, doesn't it? You see it, Vivian? You see its long tail? Yeah, but it's kind of small, it's not very big. And this is a special lizard. And it's special, maybe you can see in the picture what it's doing. This lizard can actually run on water. Isn't that wild? It's light enough and fast enough that it can just scurry right across the top of the water. And they say that it doesn't break what's called the surface tension of water. I don't really know what that means, but maybe you guys do. But because it can run on water like this, this lizard has been nicknamed the Jesus lizard. Isn't that cool? They call it the Jesus lizard, and the reason they call it that is because of our story today in the Bible. This story is about when Jesus walks on the water. The disciples have been sent out in a boat. They're way out in the middle of a lake, and Jesus, he stayed on the land to pray. But eventually, Jesus wanted to join back up with his friends. And instead of flagging down the boat and having them come all the way back to shore, Jesus said, you know what, I'm just going to go to them. And Jesus walks on the water. Isn't that wild? 
Yeah, it's one of Jesus' miracles. But the other thing I think it teaches us is that no matter where we go, Jesus can always follow. Jesus will always be with us no matter where we go, whether we're here on land, whether we go way out in the Gulf of Mexico on a boat in the water, Jesus is always with us. And I think that's great. All right, well, before we pray this morning, I thought I'd remind you, like I always do, of what Mr. Rogers would say. And that is that you have made this day a special day just by your being you. There's no one in the whole world like you. And I like you just the way you are, and God does too. Okay, well, let's put our hands together, and I'll say a prayer for us. You ready? All right. Dear God, thank you for loving us, and thank you that you are always with us no matter where we go. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, have a great time in Kids Lab. Let us pray. God of abundant life, your grace is our daily bread. Nourish us by your word and fill us with your spirit so that we may grow in faith and love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. Our first reading this morning comes from the book of Genesis. Hear now what the spirit is saying to the church. Jacob settled in the land where his father had lived as an alien, the land of Canaan. This is the story of the family of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was shepherding the flock with his brothers. He was a helper to the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his children because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a long robe with sleeves. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem, and Israel said to Joseph, are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. He answered, Here I am. So he said to him, Go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring word back to me. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron. He came to Shechem, and a man found him wandering in the fields. The man asked, what are you seeking? I am seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where they are pasturing the flock. The man said, they have gone away. For I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. They saw him from a distance. And before he came near to them, they conspired to kill him. They said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we shall say that a wild animal has devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he delivered him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. Reuben said to them, Shed no blood. Throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but lay no hand on him that he might rescue him out of their hand and restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, 
They stripped him of his robe, the long robe with the sleeves that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels carrying gum, balm, and resin on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers agreed. When some Midianite traders passed by, they drew Joseph up, lifting him out of the pit, and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. This is the word of the Lord. In church. It is so good to be with you, and I'm delighted to have an opportunity to bring the scripture to you this morning from this glorious manuscript. Um, Rex and I were chatting about it a little bit this morning, and he said, you know, not many people actually read from it, and I thought, hmm, you can actually read from it. So let us Join our hearts together as we hear now the word of God, the gospel for us from the book of Matthew. And we're in the 15th chapter, sorry, 14th chapter, beginning with the 22nd verse. Um, just as setting, we, um, we're coming to this portion of the gospel. Jesus is with the, the disciples around the Sea of Galilee. How many people have been to Israel? Okay, so you can go to the Sea of Galilee We've just had the feeding of the 5,000 up on the beautiful hilltop overlooking the sea, and now this comes next. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, you of little faith, 
Why did you doubt? When you got into the boat, the wind, when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those on the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. This is the word of God. The word of the Lord. Methodists, Presbyterians, we work it out. We work it out. Well, it is just wonderful to be here with you this morning. Thank you for the invitation. Before we begin to unpack some of the scripture text this morning, first of all, basilisks are not small. I'm just going to say, you've seen them, right? They're enormous. And the reason they call them Jesus lizards is, okay, maybe because of the walking on water piece, but mostly it's because when I see them running across, I say, oh, Jesus, protect me. <laughs> Those things are nuts. Allow me to bring you a word of deep gratitude on behalf of Habitat families in Collier County. You remember that you are one of the four founding congregations of this affiliate of Habitat for Humanity. Uh, we started this work together 45 years ago, and through that time, you have consistently been holding families in your heart, been coming out to pound nails and spread paint and make homes possible, and you have shared in funding opportunities to allow us to buy the materials to build homes, and then that original investment is returned as families repay their mortgage. Last year, your contributions, which were more than $32,000, bringing your lifetime total contributions to Habitat for Humanity to well over a million dollars. So a big round of applause and thank you for that commitment. Last year, your gifts made a life-changing difference to Marie LeBron and her two children. Marie works up at the Ritz-Carlton and her rent had gone up more than $500, more than 40% in one year's time, forcing her to leave her home, move in with her sister and her sister's family, 11 people living in a home. Marie and her daughter had to sleep in the living room, just really challenging circumstances. But today, Marie is in her own home in Whitaker Woods, and we look forward to celebrating her home dedication in December. And I hope that you'll come and be a part of that. So big and many thanks for your ongoing relationship with Habitat for Humanity. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, as we come to your word, we pray that you would open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, I offer myself to you this morning. May these words not be mine, but yours. Lord, add your blessing to our hearing and our understanding, and may the messages that we receive today help to change the world and bring us closer to you, as all God's people say, amen. So, a word of confession. When, when I'm invited to preach, as, as happens uh, periodically, I shared with, with Rex and with Don how what a joy and a privilege it is to be in many congregations throughout Collier County and to feel so warm and welcome and at home. And, uh, it, you know, it would be easy for me. I don't preach in the same place every Sunday. I could write one sermon a year and just take it on the road. Um, but that is not my discipline. And instead, I use the revised common lectionary. And so this gives me an opportunity to study afresh a new scripture text. This is the text that many congregations will be uh, unpacking today. Uh, so it, it unites us in worship in that way. It also keeps preachers from preaching on their favorite texts. Um, so, but, but as it happens, the lectionary goes through scripture in a three-year cycle. And so we would have heard this same text three years ago. It's not an unfamiliar text anyway. We're, we're certainly familiar with this story. Um, but I'll tell you that I've preached on this text before uh, because it happens every summer. And quite frankly, I'm uh, a summer fill-in 
for a lot of folks, which is all fine, very good. Um, so I went back to my previous notes and thought, hmm, what is there here that uh, speaks to me today? Well, what I found is that I've approached this text in, in a couple of different ways, and, and none of them really did it for me this year, this time, this moment. Um, the first time that I came to this text, we talked about fear, um, and certainly that's a, an element within the scripture text, fear. With the, the disciples are out on the boat, the wind whips up, and, and, uh, and they're not afraid of the wind. Remember, this is not that story. Uh, that happens another place. But, the, but here comes Jesus walking out on the water, and that's the cause of the fear. They think Jesus is a ghost? Indeed. I guess I'd be afraid to. Uh, but then, as, uh, as things happen, uh, that fear brings us to a new place. Now, fear is certainly something that we're, we're familiar with. We, we live in this unfortunate place in our, in our lives, in our civilization, in our society, where fear is almost ever-present. Uh, we're afraid of so many things. We're afraid of the way that relationships have been broken. We're afraid of what is happening as generations are growing up. We're afraid of each other. Look, our, our uh, Old Testament lesson talked about this horribly broken family relationship and, and poor Joseph. Uh, certainly thrown into a pit with no water would have been afraid. His brothers were afraid, right? They were afraid of Joseph taking the favored position in the family. Fear is an element of our lives that we just all, all are very aware of. Flip side of fear is doubt. Right? And, and so we find ourselves in positions where we're doubting. We doubt one another. We doubt what anybody's word is. We doubt ourselves and our own capacity as Peter did. And then what happened? You guys are allowed to talk in Presbyterian churches or no? Uh, frozen, chosen. Oh. Listen, uh, uh, let me let you, you are free today. Whatever else happens, you are free today. So Peter, in his doubt, begins to sink. Uh, so we know, we, and we know what, how that feels. We know what happens uh, when doubt evades our lives and suddenly we become paralyzed. It is often out of those moments of crisis, out of our moments of fear and doubt, that suddenly we find nowhere else to go but to God. It is in those moments of crisis that suddenly fear is overwhelming, we can't do anything else, and so we cry out to God. We cry out, Lord, save me. And what does God do? He shows up. God shows up. Walks across the water. Comes to us wherever we are. I love that message to the children this morning. Wherever we are, God's going to show up. And then our faith is suddenly restored as though it had ever been lost or broken. But certainly, then faith brings us to that new place and our confidence grows, our confidence in God, our confidence in ourselves and in our abilities. And now, boldly, we offer ourselves as disciples, Lord, use me, take me, send me. And we go out into new places filled with the power that God instills in us. But it doesn't last, does it? it? It wavers, it shakes. So we could have talked about fear. 
We could have talked about faith. Well, I guess we did kind of talk about those two things. But here's the thing that occurred to me as I was studying the text this go-round. I think what is happening in this encounter, and that happens to us, is something much bigger. I think what happens is that when we have an occasion to encounter Jesus, that the power of love does something to us at a molecular level. Now, I'm no scientist, but what I have witnessed over the course of my very long and getting longer life is that when we encounter Jesus, we are changed. And I believe that it is the power of love. Now, we talk about love in a lot of ways. We, we're, we're actually very casual about love, aren't we? We love our dogs. We love our children. We, some people love a basculus lizard. We love a good, juicy hamburger, some of us. We love all the, and then we love our families, and we love Jesus, and we love our church, and we love our community. We talk about love in all of these ways. But love, my friends, is an incredibly dangerous thing. And when we encounter true love, that unconditional love, the love that knows low limits, that is completely relentless in pursuing us, it changes who we are in our core at our very essence. When I was in seminary, the first thing that you do is you have to take intro to theology. You, you know what theology is. <laughs> Peanuts comic strip, anybody read the newspaper every day like I do? Peanuts comic strips right now is running a, a whole series on Snoopy as a theologian. You should read it. Uh, what is theology? The study of You're getting there. You're, you're getting there. The study of God. The study of God. Can you imagine how intimidating is that? Uh, the, and, and by the way, how pompous that we think that we can put a class together and find the answers and test on it. Uh, right? Uh, intro to theology. Uh, first assignment, 10-page paper. Um, who is God? Okay, so studiously, we all go to our, well, then, word processors. You guys don't remember that. Um, and we start working and um, come back with our treatises. And one of my classmates in the dot matrix paper roll days where you had those little preparations down the side, you remember? Um, you guys can look it up. Um, that had, had used 10 pages, remember they're all attached, you have to tear them apart, 10 pages, and had written his 10-page essay sideways. And he used three words, God is love. God is love. When we encounter God, something happens and we are changed. Peter encountered Jesus in a new way on the water. And for a moment, that love transformed Peter into having a capacity that he did not know he had. And had Peter embraced that, nurtured that, perhaps things would have gone a different way. I get an opportunity to witness this all the time. So this is my scientific study on the hypothesis that we are changed in our core when we encounter Jesus. Over the years, I've witnessed so many encounters through Habitat for Humanity 
that just shouldn't happen. It's not who we are. It's not the way the world operates. One of them just happened yesterday, as a matter of fact. I was out at Songbird, where we're building uh, beautiful new homes, and a group was out from uh, the organization Fastenal, the uh, work Fastenal enterprise, and one of their team members is, uh, has been approved to purchase a home. So they're working for Kyle and Morgan and helping to get their hours completed, get their home done. And out of no, and now, by the way, Fasten All, uh, they're, they're like uh, equipment pieces, parts, things like that, and they do a lot of delivery, they service a lot of organizations in the, in the area. Most of them are big burly guys and most of them have beards like this. Um, so these guys are out working and they're doing fantastic work and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, one of them says, hey, we should go write a message on the two by fours in Kyle's house. And before I know it, they've all headed up to Kyle and Morgan's home and eventually I made my way up there and the messages the blessings, the prayers that they left on the walls and on the floors of this home brought me to tears. It doesn't just happen that way. I saw this happen in a remarkable way when Muriel Aguirre, celebrated the dedication of his house. Muriel had come from Nicaragua, and he was the son of a prominent family. His brother had been beheaded by the Sandinistas, and his parents paid a, a coyote $5,000 to transport Muriel out of the country uh, to keep his life safe. He came into the country, was granted political asylum, Muriel worked for years, two jobs. He worked as a groundskeeper at Lely Country Club during the day, and at night he ran the presses at the Naples Daily News. And he did this in order to save up enough money to bring the rest of his family, his wife and two children, here legally. When they arrived, uh, they were able to purchase a Habitat for Humanity home. And at that home dedication with these two tiny children, Muriel in his broken English, and a, a, a group of folks that had participated in helping to build and fund uh, Muriel's house uh, were gathered and Muriel looked out at them and with tears running down his face and in his broken English, he said, I came here and I am a stranger, but you have loved me and I'm grateful the power of love. Just before that, Hugh McCall, the CEO of Bank of America, retired. And rather than a golden parachute and, I don't know, I don't know, all the things that he could have asked for at his retirement, he wanted to build a hundred Habitat for Humanity houses uh, throughout the country. And one of them was here in Collier County. And so Hugh came with his team and uh, they put up the walls on a house, and it was a, an amazing day as we're all out working together. And at one moment, Hugh McCall, overalls, red bandana tied around his head, certainly not looking like a CEO, wa was working right alongside Jose Luis Gonzalez, uh, who installs rain gutters. And they're working side by side and I happened to overhear the conversation when it became clear to Mr. McCall that the house that he was working on was going to be Jose Luis's home. And Hugh put down his hammer and he stood up straight and he called Jose Luis to stand up and he put his arms around him. And it was just this remarkable moment Demonstrating the power of love. The power of love gives us the opportunity, gives us the will, the wherewithal to do the things that we would not normally do, that maybe we could not normally do. 
Joseph comes out of the pit, sold to the Ishmaelites, goes off to Egypt, becomes the king's taster, and what happens? The, the family comes to him in the midst of famine, and Joseph, who should have said, see you later, brothers, says, come on, come on, come on back. The power of love. We see it at the Mount of Transfiguration. We see it when Jesus is transfigured, the molecular transfiguration. Jesus glows, he becomes completely different visually. Transfiguration is different than transformation. Transforming, we're transformed from one thing into another, from a caterpillar into a butterfly, and we love that story. And indeed, I think that's part of what happens to us. But I think honestly what happens when we encounter Jesus, which we do when we're here, but more often we do when we're out there, when we're encountering the other, when we're building a relationship with somebody different. We're studying about it here. We're getting ready. We're learning so that we notice those things when they happen and we can acknowledge it. We're in the process of transfiguration, becoming who God meant us to be. Transfiguration, becoming who God intends, intends for us to be. Henry Nouwen, renowned theologian, talked about our faith as a wheel, and God is at the hub of the wheel. And now one says, when we get closer to God, we get closer to each other. And the power of love changes everything. Amen and amen. Having heard God's word read and proclaimed, let us now say what we believe. Would you stand either in body or spirit? In life and in death, we belong to God. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, we trust in the one triune God the Holy One of Israel, whom alone we worship and serve. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives, teaching by word and deed and blessing the children, healing the sick, and binding up the brokenhearted, eating with outcasts, forgiving sinners, and calling all to repent and believe the gospel, unjustly condemned for blasphemy and sedition. Jesus was crucified, suffering the depths of human pain, and giving his life for the sins of the world. God raised this Jesus from the dead, vindicating his sinless life, breaking the power of sin and evil, delivering us from death to life eternal. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Please be seated. And let us pray.
Oh, gracious God, we thank you for the power of love. Your love that has reached out to us. Your love that we see in the person of Jesus Christ. Help us, O God, to share that love for others. To reach out to those in need. And we lift them up to you today in prayer. We pray for those who are hungry. We pray for their nourishment, that they would have what they need this day. For those who are fleeing, we pray for safety. And we especially lift to you the people of Maui and all who have been affected by the wildfires there. For those who are ill, we pray for their healing. And we especially lift to you the people on our prayer list. For those who are grieving, we pray for your comfort. And this day we remember Norma D'Alessandro and her family. O loving God, who patterns community after the tri your Trinity, we pray for communities everywhere. For those who are at war, we pray for your peace, that the world would know the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ. For those who are divided, we pray for unity and reconciliation. For those who are isolated, we pray for connection. For those who are afraid, we pray that you would give them courage. O Holy One, bless us in the work of faith that we might be truly faithful, sharing your love with the world. Nourish us in that labor. Keep our hope steadfast that we might know your grace and your peace. As we wait for your coming reign of justice an overwhelming love. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the one who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you've not yet done so, please find the friendship pads in your pews and fill out the information requested there. Uh, for those of you joining us online, we hope you'll make your way to our wor uh, worship page on our website and fill out the form there. That way we know everyone who's worshiping with us today. Well, beloved siblings, in gratitude for all that God has bestowed upon us, let us continue our worship as we return to God the gifts of our life. 
We will now receive the morning offering.
And, O God, in gratitude for your great love, we offer you these gifts as well as our very selves. Use us and what we have gathered for the building up of your community here and around the world. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. And now let us lift our voices for our closing hymn, How Firm a Foundation. I would be remiss if I didn't tell you how good I sound standing in front of the choir and the organ. Thanks, guys. And now go forth to find a self you can live with, a cause you can live for, and a redeemer whose love you can live into. Go to find, experience, and share the power of love. Go in peace.